I'm Heather Stewart, and I'm the convener of today's Think Tank, and I'm also the program chair for this year's 20th John K. Friesen Conference. Um, I come from a background in clinical neuroscience um, and made a move over to gerontology uh, two years ago. Uh, I now have a bridge uh, research associate position in both the Department of Gerontology at Simon Fraser University and the Brain Research Center in the Division of Neurology at UBC. Um, my day job, so to speak, <laughs> is that of the Regional Clinical Project Manager for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and I'd be happy to talk with um, any of you about that particular project um, anytime over the next three days. Um, at Simon Fraser University, I work with um, Dr. Andrew Wister, who's the PI for the CLSA at SFU, and Max Nader, who's the PI for CLSA at UBC. My research interests lie in neuroscience and naturally environmental health and aging. Now, I do want to introduce my partners in planning for this event. We'll start with Andrew Sixsmith. So, Dr. Andrew Sixsmith. Andrew, you want to stand up? <laughs> Andrew is a professor and director of the Gerontology Research Center at Simon Fraser University since 2007. Andrew is also the vice president of the International Society of Geron Technology. Since 2000, he's developed research and teaching links with many universities worldwide and has actively collaborated collaborated with other commercial and government organizations in Europe and North America. Andrew has been particularly involved in the strategic development of research in the area of technology for independent living. Much of his research has had an applied perspective with a specific aim to transfer empirical results into policy and practice. Um, Gloria Gutman, Dr. Gloria Gutman, she's not here yet, <laughs> but she'll be coming shortly. Um, to gerontologists, Gloria really needs no introduction. Um, Gloria developed and directed the gerontology department and gerontology research center at Simon Fraser University from 1982 to 2005. Um, she, Gloria wears many hats. I suspect that she's as busy or busier now than she, she ever was before. She has authored um, and co-authored hundreds of articles and reports um, a number of books um, as author and editor. In 2007, Gloria was awarded the Order of British Columbia for her pioneering work in gerontology. And um, so she'll be along shortly. I also want to acknowledge today uh, Claudine Claridge, who you met out at the registration desk. She'll be coming in shortly. Claudine is a master's student in gerontology, and she's also coordinator of some seniors programs um, at a few North Vancouver recreation centers. Nastenka Kala from uh, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Nastenka is um, Simon Fraser University's campus coordinator for PICS. Melinda Aiken. Hi, Gloria. We've just introduced you in your absence. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Melinda Aiken is our um, receptionist from gerontology. She was checking you in today. Um, I also want to welcome Zhu Huang from the University of Tennessee Martin. Zhu was a research fellow with us at the Gerontology Research Center until fall of last year, and she's come back for this event, so that's wonderful. Um, and Ryan Woolrich. Ryan, yes, hi. We've not met before. I just wanted to welcome you. Ryan is a new postdoctoral fellow at the GRC with Andrew Sixsmith. And also, um, we have Dr. Tom Kazatsky. <laughs> he just came in. Uh, Tom is, is not in um, uh, the, the list of biographies at the end of the document, but welcome, Tom. Tom is the Medical Director of Environmental Health Services at the BC Center for Disease Control, and he's well known to, to many of you. Um, Tom is also um, the scient Scientific Director at the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health. So I also want to make um, a comment about the title of today's event. 
Um, admittedly, it was inspired in part by the title of a report published in 2008 by Dr. Gary Hack, who's with us today in the third row, that's Gary, from the Stockholm Environment Institute. And his report was entitled, Growing Old in a Changing Climate, Meeting the Challenges of an Aging Population and Climate Change. So Gary, <clears throat> I really consider you a true pioneer in this new but nebulous area of research and policy. And I hope that you and your colleagues are flattered and not angry about the partial plagiarizing of your report title. <laughs> okay, so why are we here this morning? Um, and for some of us, for the two days of the Friesen Conference. So first of all, uh, this integrated event, the think tank and the Friesen Conference, is supported in part by a meeting planning and dissemination grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which we received this past February and have worked like busy beavers since then. Uh, in a nutshell, we're all here because we're in the midst of two of the most urgent and critical phenomena impacting mankind, namely global warming and rapid population aging, but very little attention has been paid by either researchers or policymakers to the interface between these phenomena apart from a few exceptions, i.e. the work that Gary Hack has done and some of the work um, coming out of the, the Health Canada Climate Change and Health Office. Uh, some of the reasons for the lack of information and policy at this interface, interface is that each issue in and of itself is highly complex and challenging. So work at the interface requires collaboration and cooperation from a lot of people from diversely different academic backgrounds and government offices who on a day-to-day -day level never even think of each other, let alone talk to each other and work together. And policy and program development requires high quality interdisciplinary research results. So I think all of us as individuals reflect on um, our own place within ecosystems, what impact we're each having, uh, for example, on greenhouse gas emissions. And we also, or at least I should say, I also consider uh, my own fate when I reach my, my senior years. There's going to be a lot of competition out there uh, for healthcare services and government programs that are already strained to their limits now. So, but I think why we're really all here is to es establish at least the beginnings of an agenda to guide research and to aid policy and program development and ultimately to optimize human health and well-being over the latter course, sort of the, the latter part of the life course while minimizing impacts on our environment. So I've asked Gloria Gutman to say a few words about the history of the, the John K. Friesen Conference. So Gloria, if you don't mind. This slide shows you a, a, photo, a fairly recent photograph of Dr. Friesen on the left and the first program cover from 1989 and the most recent one from 2009. So. Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Vancouver SFU and particularly to the Gerontology Research Center. Uh, we were established in 1982 and several years after that uh, John Friesen was brought to the GRC and we met each other. Uh, he had been involved in continuing education for a number of years at the University of British Columbia and then had gone off to do international development work in a number of exotic countries. And one of his protégés happened to be the person who was the Dean of Continuing Studies and who had recruited me to SFU. And so he brought John, and John was just such an incredible guy uh, and such a visionary that it turned out that he had put together the first conference on aging at the University of British Columbia when I was still an undergraduate student. So John and I formed a bond 
And over a, a number of years of coming to GRC events, uh, he felt that he wanted to do something that would bear his name. And so he gave us a, a modest contribution to start an endowment fund. And so in return, we said we would every year have the John K. Friesen. And originally it was called Lecture Series. But it turned out very quickly that after the first year, we started having conferences. But up until now, they've been mainly targeted to the local people. And they've been mainly Canadian events with a few people, uh, international speakers. But this year, on the 20th anniversary, we decided to expand. And since the GRC has considerable experience in putting together international meetings, this seemed like an absolute natural to take the next step forward. So uh, John was with us up until last year. He died uh, shortly after the last Friesen conference. And we miss him a great deal. He was a marvelous guy, uh, well into his 90s. We thought he might make it to 100. Uh, so he was a role model, and I'm sure that he's sitting up there today thinking, what a neat way to be celebrating my name again this year. So uh, Dr. Andrew Sixsmith is our first speaker. I've just introduced him, so I won't go over that again. Um, the title of his talk is Population Aging as a Global Issue. Do you want to use this one? Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, no, I can, I can operate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you uh, from outside Canada, welcome to Canada. Uh, from those from outside British Columbia, welcome to Vancouver. And for those people from Vancouver, welcome to the Harbour Centre. Uh, it's surprising uh, at SFU where we're spread within three uh, three campuses, one here, uh, what the main campus up in Burnaby, uh, uh, this campus here in downtown Vancouver, and we also have a campus in the city of Surrey, further, uh, further south. Um, actually, we do have some, some issues around uh, communication within our, within our university, so it's nice to see uh, such a nice, diverse group. Um, just to... Uh, just to uh, again, just reiterate one of the, one or two things that uh, that Gloria mentioned. Um, this is the twentieth uh, conference of the um, uh, in in the Friesen series, and uh, in the last couple of years, we've decided to scale up the conference uh, to uh, really address uh, issues which have got significant re relevance in terms of uh, policy and also cutting edge. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the research problems that, um, that, that we have to deal with. Uh, last year we were host of the, IS, the ISG 2010 conference, which was looking at uh, aging uh, in the context of rapid technological change. And I think, uh, I think th uh, this year's theme of aging in, a, in, um, in the context of population aging is perhaps uh, an even more significant issue in terms of the uh, challenges at a policy level and also some of the, the research challenges uh, that we encounter. And indeed, uh, it, it's an area where, uh, having spoken to my colleagues within gerontology, um, um, it, at, recent at recent conferences, for example, the Gerontological Society in America last, uh, last year, the Canadian Association of Gerontology, um, when I talked about this conference, about global warming and population aging, they said, oh yeah, that is a very interesting area. Uh, why, is n why have people not really put that together so, so much? Because these are two uh, s such important issues uh, at, at the present time uh, that really deserve to be uh, connected. And, uh, re re um, re and it's, a, in my opinion, uh, an area where we, we really have to focus our attention uh, in terms of uh, applied research. So Heather asked me today to talk about aging as a global uh, phenomenon. 
And I think probably everybody in the room is aware of population a aging. Uh, we hear about it all the time uh, in, the, in the newspapers nowadays. Um, if we look at the, the very broad statistics, uh, today almost one in 10 people are aged over 60 years old. Uh, by 2050, uh, the figure will be higher than one in five. Um, one of the, so, so we're aware of uh, population aging in general. Probably what we're not aware of so much is that currently 64% of older people live in less developed regions. Uh, in the world, uh, that population aging is a truly global phenomenon, um, and indeed, by 2050, um, 80 percent of people in um, uh, uh, over 60 years old will be living in deve less developed regions uh, in the world. Uh, globally, the uh, 60 to 79. And 80 plus age groups are, the, are growing the fastest within the uh, population categories. Uh, globally, the number of people over 80 is growing at 4% per annum, whereas the population uh, as a whole is growing at around about 1% per annum. Um, globally, people aged over 60 will outnumber children um, by 2050. Uh, in Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Europe and North America, the number of people aged uh, 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 0 to 14 has already peaked and is now, uh, is now declining. Um, population as a whole presents a number of key challenges. Uh, how do we respond to people's desire to remain aging in place? Uh, if you ask most people, um, uh, uh, seniors, older people, uh, what their preference is in terms of um, how they want to spend their old age. Most people would like to live in the communities that they're familiar with and the homes that they've lived with uh, for, for many years. Uh, we need to think about how we, may, how we can improve services and enhance people's quality of life. And particularly uh, in the context of, of this of the think tank today in the conference, how to respond to these challenges in a context of a changing climate. Uh, for those of you from outside uh, Canada, uh, this is Canada. Canada. It's a very, very big country uh, with a relatively small population. Um, population round about, say, half the size of the population of Germany. Uh, but in a country that is very, very large. Uh, if we look at uh, to the east of the map, here we have uh, the province of British Columbia, um, and down in the very south east, southwest corner, uh, we have uh, Vancouver, uh, which is probably one of the most diverse culturally uh, cities uh, in the, in the world. If we look at population uh, in the local context in Canada and British Columbia, uh, Canada has currently a population of around 34 million people. Um, British Columbia as a province has a population of around 4.5 million people. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, British Columbia has a population of 4.5 million, uh, Canada 4.9 million people aged 65 plus, or 14.4 percent. British Columbia has round about um, 680,000 people aged over 65, or round about 15 percent. These figures are set to rise to about 9.1 million, or 23 percent, and 1.3 million, uh, or 25 percent, by 2031. In a period of uh, just, o just about 20 years. Um, British Columbia has around about 96,000 people aged 85 plus, which is set to rise to around to double by uh, the year 2031. One of the take-home messages uh, that, that I'd like to present from uh, th this morning is that older people are actually a very diverse group. Well, we tend, when we talk about population aging, to think about 
uh, the, the over 65 population as a relatively, uh, as, a, as a homogenous uh, group. But if you, if you uh, look at the senior population, we can see a very high level of diversity. And just looking at issues around health, for example, we can see uh, within the population, uh, older population, that there is uh, a great deal of, uh, of diversity. And uh, I've identified a number of categories here. Uh, there's many different ways of uh, looking at the older population. Um, if we look at what might be called healthy and active seniors, most seniors, uh, i.e. people aged 65 and over, lead independent, active lives. Um, the uh, emphasis in terms of uh, health policy, for example, here, should be on prevention, about uh, supporting activity and social participation. Uh, we also need to consider that despite the image of the affluent bo boomer, uh, which is uh, now very prevalent within, uh, within the, new, uh, the, the media, uh, even within this population, uh, many will still have very limited incomes. Therefore, issues around equity of opportunity um, remains an important social issue within this population group, for example. Um, we also need to consider about those older people who have uh, significant health problems. So chronic disease, for example, is a physical or mental condition that is of long-standing duration, requires ongoing medical care, that usually has a significant impact on functional capacity and quality of life. Uh, if you uh, look at the prevalence statistics on, on health amongst older people, around in uh, British Columbia, for example, around about a third of people will report moderate to severe health problems. Um, and in British Columbia, um, around about 45% of people will report some level of disability, although only a third of those uh, people will actually report um, a severe disability that has a significant impact on their, um, on, on their activities of daily living. Um, as the population aging ages, the prevalence of chronic disease also increases. Um, the aim within uh, this particular population is to enable early interventions and avoid hospital, hospitalizations which are uh, very expensive uh, and also very disruptive uh, to people's everyday lives. If we look at people with cognitive impairments, there are a significant number of seniors will have some form of dementia. Um, probably around about 5% of the over 65 population in general um, to, over, to around about 20% of people aged over 80. We also need to consider recent new diagnostic categories, for example, mild cognitive impairment. Those people who don't have, um, uh, who have not been diagnosed as having um, uh, dementia, but have um, uh, mild um, impairments to their uh, cognitive functioning, which may have uh, maybe early indications of, uh, of um, the development of dementia. Uh, for these people, issues around activ activities of daily living, uh, safety and security, etc., are very, uh, very important. We also need to look at the socio-demographic context that many people um, um, uh, live within. Uh, we need to consider that the vast majority of help and support to those seniors who are frail and dependent is actually provided the fam by family members. Uh, for example, this is usually a spouse, a daughter, or a daughter-in-law. Um, the social bonds and desire to, desire to care for uh, older members of the family remain very strong. Um, however, uh, in our increasingly stressful lifestyles that we have nowadays, uh, Carers may have many responsibilities, jobs, families, etc., uh, which may uh, impact on their ability to, uh, to provide help and support. We also need to consider the very many people who, uh, who are frail and dependent on help and support, who are also socially isolated, 
Uh, for example, 20% of people aged 65 to 74 uh, live alone in BC. Uh, this rises to 32% of people uh, aged over 75. Uh, living circumstances are often difficult, and while people may uh, need a range of services, this is often difficult to support within economic constraints, and really many people are coping with very difficult uh, living circumstances. Um, okay, what a, the, the, the last point which I wanted to make, and I think many people would be aware of many of the statistics that I've just, uh, just gone through, that uh, I wanted to really show the uh, socio-demographic context uh, of, of population aging. But we also need to consider that aging is not just a, a, a function, it's, it's not a medical category, uh, that old age is something that in many senses is a socially constructed uh, phenomenon. Uh, so when, for example, we talk about the independence of, uh, of older people, um, we need to consider the, the, living uh, um, the living context within which people live. And that in many ways, the independence or the dependency that exists within the old age uh, population uh, is, is often a function of the, the social and physical environment uh, within which people live. Uh, for example, um, uh, Zhu Huang, who is uh, visiting us from... Um, University of Tennessee, a previous researcher here, uh, was very interested in the walkability and the livability of cities. And we can see that things like the design of houses, the design of the environment that we live in, has very significant impact on the ability of older people to live safely, security, uh, safely with security uh, and with uh, a good level of, uh, of independence. Okay, I'll draw it to a close there. Thanks, Heather. So our next speaker is Dr. Stuart Cohen. Um, Stuart is senior researcher with the Adaptation and Impacts Research Section of Environment Canada and is adjunct professor in the Department of Forest Resources Management at the University of BC. Stuart's research interests are in regional impacts of future climate change and approaches for adaptation. He's participated in regional studies throughout Canada and has contributed to national assessments in Canada and the United States. He's been a regular contributor to the United Nations IPCC reports on impacts and adaptation and is author of Climate Change in the 21st Century. Uh, Stuart's uh, title is From Observer to Extension Agent Enabling Proactive Response to Climate Change. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and First, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much to the organizers of this event uh, for the opportunity to participate in this think tank. Uh, this is a field that uh, I have not previously participated in before, so I hope to learn a lot from the various experts here who have been working in the field of gerontology for a long time. I've changed the title of my talk a little bit, uh, but I will uh, still be uh, referring to the idea of observers and extension agents in this because I think that this is going to be how climate change uh, professionals and researchers and those in the uh, public health field, the gerontology field, the emergency preparedness field can work together to jointly create uh, uh, new science, uh, new information, new learning uh, so that science can be connected to decision making and that's really uh, the theme of my presentation today. I, I want to uh, tell uh, three stories. The first one, uh, a climate story, which is the 2003 heat wave in Europe, and you'll see on the lower left here a map showing um, uh, the temperature difference between August 2003 and a normal August in Western Europe, and the color red signifies areas where temperatures were well over five degrees above normal for that month, uh, even reaching as high as 10. Uh, the heat wave was so severe that you had scenes like these two photographs on the right, uh, of many people succumbing to this. Uh, and I want to talk about that experience for a moment uh, before I get to my other two topics, which is about climate trends and scenarios, and then planning for climate change through shared learning. Um, and uh, there is now, uh, I think, post-heat wave, some literature which looks at 
how that heat wave impacted various countries in West Europe, and I want to key in on France. Um, this graphic here uh, shows uh, several things. Uh, first, there is the, um, uh, the bars, uh, which show the number of uh, excess deaths that occurred uh, during the month of August, uh, peaking in August uh, 12th and 13th, uh, where you, know, you had uh, in France over 2,000 excess deaths just on that one day. Um, the uh, temperature graph at the top, that dark line, uh, shows how temperatures jumped from 30 to 36 degrees Celsius during, the, during like the first three or four days of August and then stayed elevated for a good 10 days before going back down to normal. Uh, and you see the bars react a little bit later than that. So there's a lag between the onset of the heat wave and when it started to show up in people's health. Uh, so a uh, heat wave of this duration uh, was unprecedented and that's why it led to uh, so many excess deaths. Uh, now from the climate science field, uh, we had uh, this uh, paper by Stott and another one by Kropp and Schultz, which compared the 2003 summer temperatures, which are shown in black, to a climate scenario generated by a climate model. Had CM3 refers to the Hadley Center in England, uh, and the SRES A2 here refers to a relatively high scenario of greenhouse gas emissions growth. So in the climate field, climate modelers uh, develop these mathematical representations of the atmosphere, and these tools become available for desktop experiments from another group of researchers who track energy trends, development trends, technology trends, and try to offer different scenarios of how greenhouse gas emissions are going to grow. The A2 version is one where economy is more important than environment, where developing countries like India and France ramp up the coal use because that's what is easier for them to obtain. And so we have high emissions growth, which leads to a rapid temperature increase, which is shown in red. And in this graphic, uh, what you see is that uh, the 2003 extreme event becomes the 2040s average. So if this scenario actually occurs, today's extreme will become tomorrow's average. And that's the message from that graphic. So back to the heat wave. Uh, uh, this uh, paper by Classin, uh, which came out several years later, attempted to create a heat stroke index for Paris to see if they could recreate the same trend in excess deaths uh, as was recorded in Paris. And so the black curve shows the, uh, the death rate, the daily death rate from May to September of 2003 with the peak in August. And the red line shows the modeling results. Well, uh, the three criteria underlying this model in this index, number one was ED or emergency department admission. The third one was body temperatures greater than 39C. And the second one was that patient age was greater than 70. So what this showed was that in this case, if you wanted to model the excess deaths of this event, elderly age was an important predicting criteria. And that leads me now to the second part of this, which is to give you a little sense of what, again, the climate science community is saying about temperatures and then attempts by other fields to do translation. Our challenge here is to figure out how you translate a climate scenario into a scenario of something else. And the literature has many examples of this in water resources, in agriculture, but hardly any in the health field. Uh, there are some researchers uh, in the international arena that are trying to encourage this to occur. Um, and, and, and I think this is a field that needs uh, a lot more engagement by fields of practice by professionals in these areas to, uh, to in engage in this and to expose their own analytical tools to climate scenarios. So what's the climate science world telling us? Uh, first, if we look at observed trends, so this is not models, these are observations from around the world, three different organizations, one in England and two in the US, tracking temperatures since they were recorded directly by instruments, so the mid 1800s, and you see a temperature increase of getting around three quarters of a degree since uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Not a straight line by any means because we have natural variability that influences the climate, but we've had an unmistakable increase in temperature and this is real and not an artifact of just growth in cities. For example, we're seeing glaciers retreat in many areas. This is from Glacier National Park in Montana where they've developed something called the Paired Photography Project. 
So the photo on the left of this glazier was taken in 1940. They went back to recreate this photo in exactly the same spot in 2006, and you can see the difference. Where there was ice, you now have a lake. And there are many examples of this. That's the, uh, that's the website, if, uh, if you're interested, the USGS, US Geological Survey, Repeat Photography Project. Now, recent climate trends have contributed to increases in property damage. So now we start to leave the world of climate science and we start to look at something else. Uh, and here's where you start to have debates about attribution. Why is it that the uh, extreme events like Hurricane Katrina uh, have had such an impact on people and on property, even in developed countries, wealthy countries, that had the warning that the hurricane was going to come? And we've seen uh, over a number of years, and this is a, an index of uh, natural catastrophes that created some damage, this is a recording of the frequency of these by a major reinsurance company, the Munich Re Reinsurance Company. Uh, they update this database every year. It's on, a, it's on their website, Munich Re, and you just look for the publication called Topics Geo. So you've got a 30-year record here. And they have split the, uh, uh, the events into four categories. Uh, the red category is geophysical events, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. So nothing about climate in that one. There's no real trend in that. There's a slight increase towards the mid-late 1990s, and then it, it falls back. Uh, the other three categories, though, are all weather and climate related. The green is storm events, the blue is flood events, and the orange is temperature-related events. Uh, there has been a substantial increase in these weather and climate events that have caused property damage uh, enough so that the insurance industry is noticing this. The question now is, is this due to changing climate statistics? Is this due to development decisions? Or is both involved? And this led to this exchange in 2005 between Pilkey and, and Mills. Pilkey said there's no scientific basis that this has anything to do with climate change or changing climate statistics. It's all development patterns. More people living in high-risk areas because they have other attributes. We want to live in coastal zones. We want to live in forest interfaces. We want to live in slopes because these are beautiful places. And so the more and more people that live in these places, we should expect that just under natural variability, there's going to be more damage and more death. Mill says, uh, hold on a minute here. Uh, we're not that stupid. Uh, maybe we have a combination here of development choices, which is maybe creating increased vulnerability, and climate change, which is creating surprise. And not just surprise among climate scientists, but surprise among professionals, among professional engineers, city planners, city governments, emergency preparedness agents. People who in their professional careers and professional responsibilities implicitly assumed the same risk all along, the same mean temperatures, the same deviations of temperatures, the same statistics of rainfall. If you implicitly do that, then maybe you say, okay, here's how we design a roof. Here's how we design a sewer system. Here's how we design a, uh, an emergency response system. And so Munich Re is saying, you can't extrapolate from the past anymore. Climate stationarity is dead, according to one article. So how do we deal with that? Now, back to climate science, when they've taken different emission scenarios, like low emission scenario, which is called B1, high emission scenario called A1, I can explain those another time if, if you're interested. You get from the climate science world a very different set of outcomes. We could have a warming of one and a half degrees, we could have a warming as high as six, depending on how rapidly the emissions increase. So that's the range of uncertainty we have because there's some uncertainty in climate science, but because there's also uncertainty from the developers of these energy and technology scenarios. Totally different set of people, economists, technology, uh, technology uh, uh, experts, uh, those that deal with markets, even if climate scientists were absolutely certain about how to model climate, we have no certainty in terms of our ability to model future development because that's about economics and it's about human behavior. So we will always have ranges like this from the climate scenario world. If we look at what that means, say, for North America, here we have uh, uh, an ensemble of 21 different climate models. So we're getting a sense of what the population of climate models is saying. For annual temperature and precipitation, winter time and summer time. Red means pretty substantial warming of at least three and a half to four. Yellow is more moderate. Down here, the brown means reduced precipitation. The green means increased. 
So in the winter, we expect the high latitude regions to warm a lot more than the low latitude regions because of snow and ice retreats. You get a positive feedback so it warms further. In the summer, you get a very different pattern. The greatest warming is expected in the mid-continent because it's also expected to get drier and if you have less water around, then your additional heat energy is going to be used to heat the air rather to, to evaporate water. Now that's just climate. That's not translated yet. What does it mean? If we go to the field of agriculture, which has been working on this translation problem probably longer than any other field, you have people there developing crop yield models, for example, food trade, food supply models. And so they're trying to translate climate into food scenarios. And here is a result that was uh, reproduced in a recent World Bank publication. You've got a number of researchers, 11 different crops, three mission scenarios, five climate models. Uh, and the general picture that emerges from that population of results are a few northern areas colored green expecting greater crop yields because you have a longer warm, warmer growing season. But a wide swath of areas, especially in the subtropics and the tropics and developing countries, colored red, where they expect crop yields to decline. These are absolute crop yields declining between now and, the, and 2050. So what does this mean for food security? What does this mean for food trade, for the economic underpinnings of, of, of the people that we were hearing about before, developing countries which are rapidly aging? I'm not aware of any research yet that has put climate scenarios, food scenarios, and aging together to see what would occur. Which brings me to my third part, which is we need a shared learning model that brings these different uh, groups together in a long-term sustained way so that we can do this translation. Now here's the challenge that we face, and I, and I uh, cite Desai and Hugh for this. We have a range of research on development scenarios and climate scenarios and you know, agriculture scenarios, for example, that give us a sense of what the physical vulnerability is in the future tense. But we're superimposing that on knowledge about social vulnerability, on economic resources, information, technology, equity, and so on, which is largely knowledge of the past and present. We're superimposing a physical scenario on a social present. And that's really, really tough. And we've got to figure out how to project this forward so we've got futures being projected over futures. And so my shared learning model that I want to offer to you is we have to get past this view of information exchange that says that all we have to do is improve our information from the climate world to the world of stakeholders, and that stakeholders like President Obama or Prime Minister Harper will all of a sudden know what to do. What we need to do is bring in practitioners that can help with the translation of climate scenarios into issues of tr practitioner interest, design standards, operating rules, risk assessments, and the like. And that means practitioners have to engage with their own tools of practice, whether it's basic physical models like a crop model or something at a higher order like a health risk model or a decision support tool. So there will be climate data delivery issues to these models. So they're going to have to learn how to incorporate data that maybe they've never used before in their field of practice. Then the outputs have to be brought into practitioners who will hopefully be partners in this. And, and what I think will happen is that this will create a new conversation, that practitioners will become extension agents for climate change when they respond to stakeholders' policy desires, a conversation that the research community alone would not be able to carry out, but that the practitioner world, enabled by this experience, could. And so this is what I'm hoping that events like this would be able to foster is more of these kinds of uh, interactions in a continuous and sustained basis. And Stephen Shepard is here, and he'll talk about things like this in a moment. But this is an example of a tool that maybe will help us do that, to visualize a climate scenario and a development scenario together. So this is sea level rise in Delta BC superimposed on a scenario of sprawl in Delta BC. And you show a picture like this to people in Delta and ask them, does this make a difference to your vision of the future? And if this does, then maybe it starts a conversation that gets us closer to, for science to enable decision making. The engineering community is developing protocols for how to enable professional engineers to do that. This is the uh, 
uh, Canadian Council of Professional Engineers, Public Infrastructure Engineering Vulnerability Committee protocol, still in a draft form. But that field of practice is starting to do this. And so my hope is that public health uh, and the sciences that enable that will begin to try to figure out how do we create a protocol in this field so that we can do this too. So my concluding uh, comments for you. Uh, we have to figure out how to get climate change explicitly and quantitatively into public health services, into design and operations of facilities for seniors, into emergency preparedness. And I think this is a very important opportunity to engage uh, both communities in, in, in shared learning. And, and this is what will help science enable decision making in the public health field and specifically as we deal with aging populations. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Peter Berry. Uh, Peter is a senior policy advisor at Health Canada's Climate Change and Health Office in Ottawa, where he has conducted research on health risks of climate change to Canadians, adaptive capacity, health vulnerability assessment, and communicating climate ch change risks to the public. He's co-author of a number of Health Canada documents related to climate change and health, including chapters of the report, Human Health in a Changing Climate, a Canadian Assessment of Vulnerabilities and Adaptive Capacity, released in 2008. Currently, he's co-authoring publications to help Canadians prepare for more extreme heat events. So Peter's talk is entitled Global Warming and Population Aging, Defining the Problems. Thanks, Thanks Heather. Well, thanks very much uh, to Gloria and Heather for the uh, invitation to uh, participate in the workshop. Um, it's a real pleasure to be in uh, Vancouver and actually to see a number of uh, familiar faces uh, and to be able to learn from, uh, from experts in, uh, in this field. Uh, health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada have been um, you know, working on climate change and health issues for about uh, 10 years now. And uh, there's a couple of uh, milestones, I think, that relate to the uh, research uh, project here. Uh, in 2001, we held a climate change and health uh, conference and developed a full climate change and health research agenda, uh, which kind of guided us for uh, subsequent years. But as Heather mentioned, we also released a um, climate change and health vulnerability assessment in 2008. And both of those documents uh, highlighted the uh, key knowledge gap was uh, to look at um, uh, higher risk populations to climate change and health impacts, uh, including uh, seniors. And so just want to congratulate uh, Gloria and our colleagues at uh, SFU for really taking a leadership role in this, uh, in this area. It's really important. Okay. Now, um, with the, uh, the efforts of the uh, WHO and uh, their regional offices and international collaborators, uh, we do know that uh, climate change poses significant risk to, uh, to health and that we really need to uh, start to adapting to those. Uh, and we also know, um, as, uh, as we're finding out uh, here today, that uh, some population groups, uh, such as seniors, are potentially uh, much more vulnerable to the health impacts. This schematic shows the uh, pathways through which uh, climate change uh, impacts health, and I, I really like it. And one, one thing that I want to um, uh, highlight is that the broad range of the determinants of health that can be impacted by uh, climate change, uh, such you know, the physical environment, obviously, personal health practices, employment, working conditions, social networks, even uh, cultures. And I think this is really important uh, to keep in mind that the, the multidimensional nature of, uh, of this, uh, the pathways and some of these determinants and their complexity uh, when we talk about uh, sort of age-friendly adaptation or, or moving forward. Um, uh, some of the, uh, the st statistics that uh, Andrew highlighted, uh, you know, put against uh, the, the breadth of these determinants of health uh, really gives you a sense of uh, what we're dealing with in terms of preparing seniors for climate change. Now, ultimately, vulnerability is a, uh, a function of the sensitivity of uh, populations, uh, the exposure to climate-related hazards, and the adaptive capacity of individuals and communities to take actions to, uh, to protect themselves. I've got a few slides on the first two, uh, but really want to focus uh, some of the discussion on the adaptive capacity, because I think this is going to be critical in terms of our efforts to, uh, to address some of the health risks uh, uh, that uh, are increasingly going to be faced uh, by seniors. 
Now, some populations obviously are uh, more uh, vulnerable or at higher risk because of multiple sensitivities to climate change uh, hazards. This chart is taken from uh, information from results uh, from our uh, climate change and health vulnerability assessment that uh, was mentioned. And it shows why we should be concerned, I think, about the uh, potential uh, health impacts on seniors. Um, and, and in fact, um, they have uh, uh, um, increased sensitivity to virtually all of uh, the major uh, climate change and health uh, issues um, of concern. Uh, so you see that they're, uh, they're highlighted, uh, you know, temperature-related uh, morbidity and mortality, the health effects of other uh, extreme uh, weather events, air pollution-related uh, health effects, um, water and foodborne contamination, and vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, for example. And of course, uh, these sensitivities become much more problematic when the frequency and severity and potential exposures uh, to extreme weather events are increasing as they are in Canada and we've heard uh, globally. Uh, this figure is uh, taken from data from the Canadian Disaster Database and it shows the, the increasing um, uh, frequency of uh, natural disasters in, in Canada. You really notice how important uh, flooding is uh, with respect to, uh, to natural disasters. Now, uh, the good news is that over the uh, last number of decades, we've actually decreased uh, mortality related to these events, basically because of better uh, healthcare systems, uh, a greater awareness on behalf of the public, um, and uh, better infrastructure, although we, we do know that we have uh, a lot of challenges with, res uh, with respect to uh, infrastructure. And this has already been mentioned, um, the, uh, the, the heat wave uh, in, uh, in Europe in 2003. But I think what's really important here is to, to understand that uh, both developed and developing countries can experience catastrophic health impacts from climate-related uh, hazards. And there are disproportionate impacts on various populations. And, uh, and so we saw that um, uh, in uh, this particular heat wave, uh, seniors were affected uh, more so, as was already stated. But also, I believe, in the Russian uh, heat wave in 2010, which uh, I understand some estimates suggest that uh, almost 55,000 people uh, died. Um, and, and so this is really uh, important to keep in, in mind. And we're fairly sure that exposure to some of these climate-related hazards, in this case uh, extreme heat events, will increase significantly if further adaptation actions uh, are not uh, taken. So this figure shows uh, projected uh, future hot days uh, in select Canadian cities and actually uh, warm nights. Uh, the hot days are uh, days um, uh, above 30 degrees uh, Celsius. And you see that uh, for a number of uh, different cities, um, we're expecting uh, them to uh, increase dramatically. Now, th this is one uh, uh, modeling run, and um, you know, there, there is uh, uncertainty associated with uh, uh, particular runs, but it gives a sense of um, uh, where we might be headed. Uh, 30 degrees Celsius is um, uh, quite important because uh, although there's a fair amount of variation for a number of Canadian cities, you actually see excess deaths um, uh, from heat increase, uh, uh, sometimes in the mid-20s uh, in terms of the, uh, the temperatures. So... So this is really important from a public health uh, perspective. And this was uh, already mentioned, too, uh, in uh, much more detail. Um, the expected increase in the population of seniors in Canada and in other countries is going to compound the effect of an increase in the frequency and severity of climate-related uh, hazards. And I think it's really going to um, force more aggressive adaptation efforts uh, by communities, uh, by public health and uh, emergency management officials, and even by seniors themselves. And ultimately, I think, to adapt successfully, we need to address any existing um, concerns related to the adaptive capacity that may increase uh, vulnerability. So in our assessment in uh, 2008, there were a number of areas of uh, concern that we, uh, we highlighted that I think we uh, probably need to reflect upon in terms of uh, how we move forward with um, uh, efforts to uh, help seniors prepare themselves for uh, uh, some of these uh, increased risks. So, for example, um, individuals play a, a primary role in adaptation, uh, but Canadians often do not perceive a threat from natural disasters and may not actually be taking some of the actions that they, uh, they need to. Uh, many sectors play a role in reducing vulnerabilities to health risks of climate change, but they don't always integrate human health considerations into their actions. So, for example, um, urban design issues uh, with re uh, respect to reducing the urban heat island effect um, it's something that, uh, from a preventative approach in Canadian communities, um, one would argue uh, needs to be increased uh, so that you can actually prevent the heat from, uh, from affecting health. 
Uh, response systems, infrastructure, and risk management uh, approaches have been designed to respond to discrete health risks or climate events based on past uh, climate uh, trends. I think this is uh, mentioned by uh, Stuart already um, and, uh, and is really quite uh, important. Also, any gaps in public health and emergency management activities that have the potential to significantly affect uh, the ability of Canadians to effectively plan and respond to climate change uh, in Canada. And I think what's really important too is that the likely, likelihood of cumulative impacts and the possibility of irreversible environmental changes uh, suggests that there might be limits to adaptation. It was really interesting, about four or five years ago, um, we uh, did a, um, a simulation, a heat wave simulation, uh, or collaborated with, uh, I believe it was the city of Toronto, and uh, we suggested, well, when you, when you do the uh, simulation um, and you build your scenario for the simulation, why not look at an extreme heat event and say an infectious disease outbreak? And they just said, well, no, 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 no. Uh, we, like we wouldn't, we wouldn't know where to start when we, actually, uh, when we actually did that. And it was really, for me, it was really telling in terms of the, the potential of cu these sort of cumulative uh, uh, impacts to overwhelm uh, uh, systems. And, and, and we don't have a, a good understanding of that. And similarly, I think little information is available from a public health perspective about when key thresholds might be crossed. Um, and particularly in the face of uh, some of these cumulative uh, impacts. So, um, you know, what does all this mean for uh, moving forward with, um, if we maybe call it age-friendly adaptation uh, to climate change? I think a really important starting point is to conduct a scan of um, uh, climate-sensitive programs to see if they're mainstreaming climate change uh, into them and to actually push that further and see if they're addressing the needs of, um, of seniors uh, and their aspirations uh, towards uh, more healthful lives. Um, so this figure shows the range of uh, potentially climate-sensitive uh, public health programs uh, that might be of interest. Um, we're really lucky in, uh, at the federal level to have the Division of Aging and Seniors at the Public Health Agency of Canada that's really taking a leadership uh, role um, in terms of some of these emergency issues and, uh, and health and, uh, of seniors issues. But there's, there's other, uh, other programs that uh, could be sort of climate sensitive. So food, uh, food safety, um, food security was already mentioned, um, infectious disease management, mental health, uh, that's a big one. I think Andrew uh, uh, highlighted a number of stats uh, with respect to that. the health of northern populations, travel medicine, air and water quality. I expect emergency preparedness will be talked about a fair amount uh, today in, in the conference. Occupational health, how to deal with extreme heat events. Um, uh, children's environmental health, uh, healthcare system capacity. So if you have these multiple pressures on health and social services, will they be able to uh, maintain the, the level of service to, uh, to seniors? Um, and maybe indirectly even sustainable uh, development as well. Now, I think to, to really um, support uh, future adaptation efforts, um, I'd suggest that uh, the following knowledge needs related to climate change impacts of seniors that were actually identified in our health assessment uh, be considered as part of the research agenda building uh, process. Um, so uh, the need for more extensive data on illnesses and deaths from key climate change health concerns, uh, the role of health services in aiding victims of natural disasters, uh, the future social uh, demographic trends with which to gauge vulnerability uh, would be an important uh, one, I think. Uh, mental health, again, the social, psychological, and mental health, health impacts of natural hazard, hazards. There's very little known about that, particularly in Canada. Uh, integrated activities to protect vulnerable populations from health risks associated with air pollution and heat waves. This is something that our office is uh, trying to look at with um, uh, our air program at, uh, at Health Canada. There's a lot of demand from uh, communities when they're developing heat alert response systems and the air quality um, uh, alert systems, how do you integrate the communications, uh, these types of things. Uh, the best practice adaptation measures, uh, for example, outreach activities, assistance to vulnerable populations, monitoring of health impacts. What actually works when we go into communities? Uh, they want to know what's effective in terms of adaptations um, and, and not just what other uh, uh, communities are doing. Uh, characteristics or qualities that uh, make specific populations more vulnerable to uh, health risks related to climate change and the distribution of such vulnerable groups in Canada. A lot of communities are really moving towards uh, GIS mapping of where, um, uh, for example, people with chronic illnesses uh, have uh, so that they can target them during extreme heat events. And risk perception related to climate change health impacts among individual Canadians that influences capacity to adapt. So. These are the kind of uh, my short list of uh, some areas where it uh, might be uh, helpful to pursue uh, more. 
So just to, uh, to end off, um, I think that the greater knowledge of climate change impacts on seniors will really help uh, us uh, build and, and more importantly inform a number of the uh, climate change and health uh, adaptation actions that are actually ongoing. Uh, there is, a, it's really exciting, the last four or five years there has been a lot more action uh, from health agencies in Canada but also outside of Canada trying to address these um, uh, issues and protect uh, people. This is a, a sort of um, a chart I developed um, uh, from my notes from a, a, a workshop uh, put on by the Pan American Health Organization. Uh, I believe Carlos Carl uh, Corvalan is um, uh, uh, going to be at the conference tomorrow. He put this on and it was he brought together a number of um, countries uh, to discuss climate change and health issues. And I was quite surprised about the range of actions that are out there. Um, and, and you can see them, I, I don't have time to, to go through all of them, but uh, um, in terms of doing assessments, developing uh, health adaptation strategies, um, the public health officials are really becoming more, more active. And so I think this uh, workshop uh, agenda, this uh, research agenda uh, workshop really has a good opportunity here of informing um, uh, some of these actions that, uh, that are occurring and particularly bringing in the needs and uh, concerns of, uh, of seniors into that uh, mix. So I'm really excited about uh, today and about the conference tomorrow. So I'll just uh, leave it at that. Oh, and the other thing I did do on the, um, the rest of the presentation, which I, I won't go into, uh, I've done a bit of a uh, scan of the other knowledge gaps from the uh, vulnerability assessment, uh, if it's of interest to people. There's uh, about five or six slides. Uh, the, the report's about four or 500 pages, so I thought that might be of, of use to people. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is Dr. John Stone. Uh, John received his education in the UK with degrees in chemistry, math, and physics. He came to Canada as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Research Council. His career uh, has been with the federal government where he worked at the NRC, External Affairs and Environment Canada. John ran the federal climate research program for several years and advised ministers on the issue of climate change. He served on the Bureau of the IPCC for the third and fourth assessment reports and also work for the International Development Research Center. Uh, John retired in 2005 and is currently an adjunct research pr professor at Carleton University in Ottawa. And his talk is Climate Change and Aging Connected Stresses. Welcome. Thank you. Heather. Well, good morning. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, just a few general comments to start with. Um, First of all, as someone who legitimately carries around a senior card in my wallet, I'm somewhat nervous of being faced with a room full of um, people who study aging. Uh, the second, when I was invited to, to come and, and join with you, um, I thought long and hard about it because um, my sense was that from the published literature, there really wasn't um, a lot to say. Um, but that's, that's encouragement for actually having this think tank so that we can sort of think about the research that needs to be done. But it does remind me that um, when I mentioned this invitation to a friend of mine um, at, at the International Development Research Centre, um, Dominique Charon, um, I said I'm talking about climate change and ageing and her immediate reaction was, they're both bad. <laughs> so that's a good place to start. The third general comment is um, one that's now being realized. Uh, there is going to be some overlap between what I say and some of the slides that I show and those that have been shown already by Stuart Cohen and by Peter. Um, but there's some important points and then maybe I'll make some slightly different observations. So my talk is about some of the interactions um, between climate change and aging. Uh, first of all, climate change is more than a smooth increase of global temperatures. And for that reason, I tend not to talk about global warming, but about climate change. Um, the, 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 there are other variabilities, for example, precipitation, winds, and, and the like. But what I want to focus much of my comments on are, are 
the extreme events. And we know from simple physics and statistics that we are headed to an era in which there is going to be uh, more frequent and more severe extreme events. And the reason for, for focusing on this is I believe that extreme events are, uh, such as heat waves, are amongst um, some of the threats that particularly will affect old peop older people. And, um, and hence, I'm hoping that this will make some of it more contribution to this think tank. Now, if I could have the first slide, please. This is one you've seen already. Um, but I want to make a couple of points um, on, this, on this slide. Um, first of all, just to refresh your memory, um, this is temperature increases uh, against time here going out to the end of the century. <clears throat> These are actually differences from, from previous normals. Um, they, they represent, by and large, especially these uh, curves over here, what might happen in the future. And I say what might happen because, of course, we don't know exactly how the drivers of climate change, particularly our supply and use of energy, of technologies, and other socioeconomic factors, such as population growth, are, are going to work out. So, as Stuart was saying, I mean, what we, we rely on are sort of what-if scenarios. They're, they're all equally plausible to the extent that there's not, not one of them is favored. But each of them has a slightly different combination of those, those climate uh, change drivers so that, that drive essentially emissions of greenhouse gases that lead to the increase of the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that lead to the threat of climate change. So um, let me just look at the, these curves here. This is um, the temperatures that are projected uh, to occur between now and, and the end of this century. And, and there's quite a, very, uh, a range here, but the, the the worrying factor is, if you sort of find an average of them, it suggests that there's going to be a warming of about two to three degrees Celsius during this century. And to put that into some perspective, the warming that we saw over the last century was only 0.7 degrees, roughly three quarters of a degree. In other words, we're expecting in this century a warming that is four to five times greater than it was in the last century. That's the first point. The second has to do with the inertia of the climate system. The climate system has an enormous amount of inertia. Once you push it in a certain direction, it keeps going. And, and that's what this purple line shows here. It says, it shows the results of what would happen if we could freeze the concentrations or emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at the present time. There are two things that happen. One is because of this inertia of the physical climate system itself. That's going to lead to at least an increase of 0.1 degrees Celsius per decade for the next several decades. But the drivers of that climate change have also got an inertia. The drivers, what I mean by that, are the cars we use, the power stations that we use to produce, produce our electricity. We're not going to go out and overnight change all of that. They're, they have a life cycle. And that is going to add a further 0.1 degree Celsius per decade. In other words, we're up to 0.2 degrees Celsius. But all of that is history that's already written because of that inertia. And what that means is that regardless of what these scenarios are, over the next few decades, the increase of temperature is going to be the same. It's going to be roughly an additional degree. So as I said, that part of history is written. 
there are going to be impacts, and so adaptation to those projected impacts now becomes not a policy alternative, but a policy imperative. Next slide, please. So what about Canada? This is a slightly different diagram to I think the one that Stuart showed about what the temperature increases will could be in Canada by the, the middle of the century. Um, again, what you see is the greatest warming is in the winter or in the fall, and it occurs the further more the, the further north you go and the closer you get to the continental interior. These are projections, but they're in the right direction given the observations today. There is already significant evidence that the climate is, in fact, warming, particularly, as far as we in Canada are concerned, in the Arctic. The sea ice in the Arctic is declining faster than any of our models projected. There are now projections that suggest that the Arctic could be ice-free, entirely ice-free, by the end of the summer season within the next two decades. That's going to have huge numbers of implications, some of which we already see that are affecting the lives and the lifestyles of the indigenous people, the Inuit and the others who live there. There are other impacts of climate change that we know quite well that re relate to um, disease vectors, for example. Um, one example that's been discussed quite a, a lot in the literature is the northward expansion of the Lyme disease vector with a two to four increase in tick abundance. Um, but my sense is that with the public health services that we've got in this country, we ought to be able to cope with that. Other countries are not going to be so, um, so well positioned. Developing countries, their perhaps greatest impact is going to be from an increase in malnutrition as locally produced product, products, produce, suffers from greater water stresses. This is going to be a problem that's going to exacerbate existing stresses in developing countries, such as those that are caused by poverty and disease and unstable government. Appropriate to this conference, older people are typically more vulnerable uh, for reasons of health and resources than other segments of society. And that's what we're going to talk about in this think tank. But I mentioned those just few examples because they illustrate an important point I'd like to make, and that vulnerability to climate change needs to be examined in the context of other stresses and of other available uh, uh, resources. And somebody, I think it was, was Stuart or, or maybe Peter, talked about potential flooding. Um, I've always been curious when I've flown into Vancouver Airport, particularly if you come in from the sea, just how much height there was in the airport above sea level. Well, yesterday on the plane that I arrived on, it had one of those little sort of maps, and it told me that it's five foot, that's shorter than me, above sea level. I'm sure the error of that is about two feet either side. But the point is, it's not going to take very much of a sea level rise and of a storm to completely flood a lot of lower Vancouver, including the airport. The next bit. So let me get back to some of the extreme events. You've seen this diagram already twice. <clears throat> As I've already suggested, climate change is more than a steady 
uh, increase of global average temperatures. As such, that might be relatively easy to adapt to. But it's the extreme events, short though they may be in duration, that can cause the most damage. And as I said, from very simple statistics and physical reasons, we can expect there to be an increase in the severity and the frequency of these extreme events. And if these extreme events occur soon, one after the other, so that the time for recovery is short, then there is an enhanced impact from, from these events and an enhanced stress. As an example, as the folk who live in the Red River Basin in Canada, a few years ago they had a huge flood, so large that it was called the Sixth Great Lake. They're having another one now. And that affects them psychologically. They're always afraid. They always have a fear of, of that next flood and whether they're going to be spared or affected again or not. And it's particularly old people that are affected by that stress. In part because of mobility problems. As much of you, many of you, I'm sure, figured out the reason that it was mostly old people that died in the tsunami in Japan was because the old people couldn't run fast enough to get out of the way. So clearly mobility in older, older folk um, is important. We have about two minutes left. Well, I've got more than that, okay. so I'd better run. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but all right. Um, let me talk... A, I, I, quickly, though, about this European heat wave in 2003. Here is a chart which shows previous summer temperatures. For every year, there's a line. And you can put a kind of probability distribution curve around that, your typical bell curve. But here's where 2003 is. It clearly is outside the range of previous natural variability. If we look at our present climate for, and over the last 100 years and we try to reproduce that with our models, we, we get a fairly similar pattern. Of course, we don't reproduce these extreme events that we saw. If we try and do the same thing and use the models out to the end of what, the last 30 years of this century, then we see the spread of temperatures going way, way over to, to the right-hand side. And that the 2003 temperature no longer becomes abnormal. The next one. Uh, this is one that um, I think Stuart showed that this is over a longer period of his slide, this is the, the deaths that reported, this is the temperatures up here, and if, as he pointed out, um, the deaths seem to have a slight lag from the temperatures. I understand that's something that medical science can appreciate it. There was another heat wave last year in, in Russia, you must have heard about, and here is a similar diagram, this, uh, this sort of probability distribution function, uh, of, of past uh, temperatures in the summer. Here is last year, 2010, way outside that normal range. You, interestingly, the, the next hottest it was 2003. Um, let's have the next slide, so I'll go on a bit more quickly. And the next, I just press it again and keep going. Um, this has to do with return rates recurrence time of, of extreme events for warm events and for cold events. Um, if we can imagine hypothetically that uh, a really extreme hot day is about 33 degrees Celsius, then
then, then today the return rate is about 80 years. In other words, we'll get such an extreme temperature once every 80 years. By 2050, by the middle of the century, <coughs> we're going to see that extreme event happening roughly once every 10 years. And towards the end of the century, it essentially be once every year. The happy thing is, for some people, is that cold events will occur much less frequently. But there's a recent paper which suggested that although cold events will occur less frequently and maybe less severe in, in absolute temperature reaches, that they could extend, they could uh, last for just as long as they do at the moment. The last thing I wanted to show is sort of the conundrum that we, that we face is if we're going to avoid such things as heat waves, um, we're going to have to stay, adapt. Uh, one of the ways of adapting is through air conditioning. Here's how we use energy in the North America. I mean, it's, this is a uh, use for the US, but for Canada it's not very different, although there's differences depending on which part of the continent you're in. Space heating occurs for almost 30%, space cooling for about 11% here. Um, we're expecting that this segment to decrease, this segment to increase. But if that's going to be so, the amount of energy that we need may say the same. It may actually increase. And then we have to ask, that, so where do we get the energy from? Do we continue to get it from fossil fuels? Because if we do, that's going to increase the problem that is climate change. What it forces us to do is think about using other fossil fuels, renewable energy sources, for example, which will emit less carbon dioxide. Thank you. And I um, just want to introduce the discussion facilitator for session one, um, Dr. Tim Takaro from uh, Simon Fraser University, Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, Tim is a physician scientist and associate professor and associate dean for research in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, Tim's training is based in occupational and environmental medicine, public health, and toxicology from Yale, and also from the Universities of North Carolina and Washington. If you want to read the rest of Tim's biography, it's in the booklet. Um, Tim, take it away. Thanks very much, Heather. It's a pleasure to uh, get to lead this august uh, panel uh, in discussion. I am... Um, I'm really heartened by the uh, shift in emphasis over the last uh, 10 years or so in public health. Uh, when we talk about climate change, it's no longer if, uh, but it is um, <clears throat> how much, uh, who will be affected, um, and um, what do we need to do about it. So the challenge is shifting um, uh, from mitigation, which is still, of course, extremely important, to uh, what are we going to do with what we've already got in the bank uh, in terms of um, in terms of climate change? So I was um, I was uh, very um, intrigued by uh, some of the notions uh, raised today by the speakers. Um, one of them is this uh, notion of um, uh, the extenders or extension agents, as uh, Stuart uh, brought up, and it um, reminds me of. Um, a fact that hasn't been addressed too much uh, yet uh, in the conference, but I'm sure will be later. And that is, yes, it's true that uh, aging population uh, is an increasingly vulnerable population, but within the aging population, uh, it's those with chronic disease that are the most vulnerable um, in that group. And if you look at the death rates uh, in um, extreme events in Chicago in 95 or um, France in 2003 or Russia in 2010, uh, the deaths are largely uh, from uh, exacerbations of uh, chronic illness, so uh, elderly with cardiovascular disease or compromised respiratory systems that, uh, that force uh, uh, or cull, uh, in the crude sense, uh, those uh, most vulnerable. So what I'd like to do, if I could, with the panel is um, um, uh, draw from your experience about uh, adaptation 
uh, for uh, the most vulnerable within um, within the aging population. And um, uh, perhaps if, um, uh, Stuart, I'm going to put you on the spot since you uh, came up with a, an example, the Canadian Council of Professional Engineers, um, how you might uh, envision uh, that kind of extension um, uh, happening in other sectors uh, that could uh, address some of these vulnerabilities uh, that have been identified so far. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, within the Canadian Council of Professional Engineers, um, they struck this committee, the PIEVC, um, to establish a protocol for how professional engineers could take climate scenarios and use them for things like designing sewer systems or designing roofs to deal with a change in snow loads, real nuts and bolts things that are part of the engineer's professional practice. And so their protocol was about a series of steps that an engineer could take to use what is still unfamiliar source of information. You know, taking temperature from a climate model output is different from taking temperature from a standard station archive. Uh, so what are the rules for actually doing this and still being able to say to your client that you've carried out due diligence within your field of practice, you create a report, you submit it to the client, whether it's a developer or it's a municipal government and so on, um, and you state the various caveats as you normally would as a professional when you're dealing with your uh, operating context today. And so they established this set of steps for operating this way, and then they went out and tested it in a number of case studies. For instance, they did one here on the Vancouver wastewater system. They did one in Castlegar, a small town east of here, on their sewer system, and they've done it uh, around the country. And it's through this series of cases done in partnership with uh, community uh, uh, interests and municipal governments that they test out this protocol. They, they engage contractors. The contractors get climate scenarios from recognized sources of climate scenarios. They carry out a specific task as they would normally in their field of practice for clients, say, town of Castlegar, and they produce a result. Uh, and so the learning experience is, you know, were we able to take this climate scenario and translate it into a risk on the sewer system? And what was the difference between doing it this way and doing it the way that we always used to from station data that tells us about the past? So that learning experience says something about the availability of climate data, the differences in using it. How did they have to modify their analytical tools? You know, in, in the case of, of sewers, you're dealing with extreme rainfall, so that's familiar territory. In the case of health outcomes, you may be using climate information indirectly, and so that might uh, require some other steps in order to, say, look at risks to elderly people or disease rates if they're from one cause or another. So that's what that was about. It was about coming up with a process, testing it in cases, having the sanction of the professional organization, and then uh, ultimately having that protocol in place approved by that organization, which they still haven't done, but hopefully will happen soon. And that will give licensed engineers uh, the mandate to use climate scenarios in their field of practice. Uh, and uh, as long as they demonstrate due diligence, hopefully they will not be exposed to liability claim. Um, I see that Peter is uh, reaching for the mic, and I was hoping you you might. Um, one of the uh, one of the things you might not have uh, noticed, John, when you flew into the airport, that was at the sewage treatment plant, was also at the same yeah. level. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't have just that liability. I'm I'm glad that the uh, engineers are thinking about that. Um, but um, <clears throat> Peter, where in um, public health would you say? Um, is a parallel for uh, this adaptive response that the engineers are going through. Yeah, I, I think I've got a good example that uh, complements uh, Stuart's uh, example. Um, we're, we've got a, a four-year uh, initiative to prepare communities and individuals for extreme heat events. Uh, and dealing with our four, four pilot communities, um, uh, uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Winnipeg, Manitoba, the Assiniboine Health Region in Manitoba, and Windsor, Ontario, They've uh, basically asked for uh, some assistance assessing vulnerability uh, to extreme heat events so that they can actually go out and target their uh, health personnel when they have these events uh, to people that have the chronic diseases because they know very well that it's not all uh, seniors that are, that are vulnerable and they've got limited resources. 
So we've actually adapted um, guidelines that the WHO developed on doing climate change and health vulnerability assessments um, to extreme heat. So we've developed uh, extreme uh, heat uh, uh, vulnerability assessment guidelines for communities that, uh, uh, that we're uh, hoping to release pretty soon. And, and what, what they do is they provide uh, direction for communities uh, to actually assess um, uh, what some of the individual characteristics are um, that uh, should be um, uh, should be known and should be uh, monitored. What are some of the community characteristics? Um, and uh, and you know we go through a, a whole range of these. And and as I mentioned in my talk, there's a lot of interest in sort of uh, overlapping these with um, a GIS uh, a technology. So we're hoping that this is uh, of a lot of um, interest to to communities. And I know an, another example that Anastasia from our office will be discussing this afternoon is um, how to effectively communicate to some of these uh, populations. Um, and how to target to some of these subpopulations um, so that they actually change their behaviors. I wonder if um, I, I can get some audience participation on this. I, I know there are some of you in, in the audience who engage in um, uh, public health. And um, what, uh, what mechanisms do you need in your community uh, to, I, A, reach uh, these populations, um, the communications aspect, uh, but B, and perhaps more importantly, um, once you reach them, do something on the ground. Uh, it's not going to be uh, the physicians uh, in their offices that are going to make a difference here uh, during an extreme uh, weather event. Hopefully they will be responding in the emergency room, uh, unlike uh, happened in Paris. Uh, but uh, what, what, is, what do your communities uh, need? Tom, I'm going to put you on the spot because I know that uh, you... Uh, do engage um, public health in uh, this realm. What, what uh, do you see as the community needs for uh, responding to heat events? Well, it's really the health departments, the health authorities who are responsible for that, where we, the BCCDC and myself included, advises them with respect to who appears to be vulnerable based on the evidence uh, that we have of past heat events. And I think that the plans are, the initial plans were to develop a heat response system, which is, I think, um, something that was encouraged largely by the federal government as, I think, a mistake uh, in many ways, that, to put all of your eggs in the basket of heat response. A lot of it is heat preparedness and heat adaptation, and there are a number of ways that that are already being done by the by public health in Vancouver, which is not a, a place known for, for hot events. And that has to do largely with uh, building adaptive capacity. So that's things like uh, creating cool spaces primarily uh, throughout the city, um, having uh, respite uh, in seniors' residences, uh, shelters, uh, chronic care institutions with cool spaces or in particular air conditioned spaces within them because air conditioning is entirely protective uh, for those people who stay within it during hot events. Uh, further, uh, encouraging um, uh, kind of progressive acclimatization to heat because it's the early summer periods that are worse than the late summer periods when people are more adapted. So encouraging people to, to regularly adapt if they don't have other means of of protection if they're not the people who are most vulnerable. And I guess finally creating social solidarity, things like buddy systems, uh, keying in the Meals on Wheels programs, the visiting nurse programs, everything to let people know that heat is an issue and what can be done to protect people uh, with respect to heat. So getting that out to the people themselves and their caregivers and the people around them. So the more the more social interchange there is around heat, the stronger it'll be and the less likely we are to fall prey to heat. And I think the thing, one thing that should be said is that, is that although the, war, the, the North America is getting stronger, in cities that have done some of those things, the heat response uh, in terms of mortality per additional degree of temperature has gone down. So that, so that many cities in North America have shown capacity to respond to heat either through air conditioning or through some of those other things. Uh, and and uh, in Montreal, for example, the heat response has been largely blunted uh, largely by the by having heat warnings and, and building those kind of solidarities through the community and those sorts of adaptive measures. And, and I think that that's the direction in which Vancouver is going largely. Can I just respond? Yeah, please. Um, 
Just very quickly, um, I think Health Canada, in terms of the HeLearn response systems, we actually envisage, Tom, the, the full package that you talked about, the preventative uh, approach, um, as being part of the, the broader heat alert and response uh, type of um, uh, system. So I don't think we're talking about uh, two different things. And uh, a best practices guide that uh, we're developing actually has information on um, uh, preventing uh, heat uh, uh, from affecting your community and some of these uh, social uh, implications too. So I just wanted to uh, provide that clarification. Thank you. Tom, I just add to what you were saying. Um, I think it's it's gratifying that we have learned some things from the heat wave ex episodes in the past. Um, and that responding to them has to be done in the context of the social environment in which the people... And, and just a couple of, of, of things. Um, and I don't know the literature well, but I can recall during the Chicago heat wave, which was some years ago now, um, many of the older people in theory had the option of an uh, energy-free air conditioning system simply by opening windows, doors. But they couldn't and they were afraid to do that because they lived in, in areas, poor areas, where th that would reduce their, their security and the like. And so I think we have to think about that social context. In, in France, in, in, I think they've certainly learned a lot from the heat wave of 2003. But it, you know, it's with some embarrassment because most of the people that, that the additional deaths were older people, 17 over, who to my understanding were not seen and hence forgotten. And, and so I think we've, we've learned some of those things and, and you know, these aren't medical things per se. They're, 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 they're that social context in which these older people live and the stresses that they face. Um, I wonder, Andrew, if you might uh, address this notion of um, the solidarity. Um, as you pointed out, uh, the elderly population is quite diverse in terms mm -hmm. of their abilities. Um, and surely there is a... a a large active uh, component of that population which can um, very very easily serve this solidarity function um, when uh, when needed and is is there are there any examples uh, of uh, organization within the, that sector to uh, uh, increase the adaptive capacity of the population in general um, uh you mean in terms of self-help groups, that, yes. that kind of thing? Uh, the solidarity that Tom was uh, referring to that does um, uh, support people in the time uh, when, when, when it's needed. Uh, I, I think one of the, one of the issues, uh, and I tried to raise it in, the, um, in, in my presentation, is that uh, re really the, the kind of formal groups that exist are, are, are relatively um, minor in the uh, in in the lives of uh, of, of older people, uh, older people tend to um, who, who do need help and support tend to be supported by families and uh, and uh, their, their, their social networks are absolutely uh, important. Um, what I did notice on one of the slides, I think I think it might have been uh, one of John's about um, it. It seemed to be particularly older people who were living alone that appeared to be very very vulnerable. And uh, what, one of the areas that I'm interested in uh, uh, is in the, in the way technology may be able to help people. Because in some ways, this, this, a lot of these issues are around, are around information about how to, uh, how to really uh, help yourself in the times of these, uh, th these extreme uh, uh, health events. So, and a lot of older people are, um, are, are um, in information poor. And they're excluded, uh, or but whether that's through issues around access, isolation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, from uh, from information which might help them, uh, whether that's information from the families or information from from the media. Thanks very much. Uh, yes. Hi, Alexander Alec Austin, University of Victoria. Going to solidarity, I would say we need to take an historical view. The historical view I would take is something like this. 
In the 50s and 60s, we built a pension system in this country. That was about a society taking a, a view around solidarity historically. If you then look at 2008 and the recession of 2008, the first items on the chopping block in terms of social policy were private pension plans, particularly in the private sector. If you then go back to what someone said in one of the side presentations here about the need to project into the future social policy future scenarios in 20 years, what that looks like is a decline over long view of a social historical solidarity. And what that means is 20 years from now, if the current trends go on, we're going to have an elderly population that does not have the backing of public and private pension systems like we've got today. And the kinds of questions we need to ask, I think, around solidarity are what is the broader social policy environment going to look like in 20 years which is going to support uh, this kind of social policy solidarity to ensure that seniors can have the wherewithal to purchase air conditioning, for example, uh, uh, to, to get to these uh, space, cooling spaces, for example. So these are the kinds of, these are the ways I think that we need to think about social solidarity in the future as climate change evolves. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally uh, agree with that point, and I would uh, just reiterate that um, it's not going to be the medical profession that is responding. Um, there isn't the capacity, uh, and uh, this base of uh, solidarity uh, is is really where the action is likely to be, and it um, is certainly something that can integrate with the health system, and there is a recent publication from the federal government on um, pro health providers' uh, response to um, extreme weather, uh, extreme heat events, but um, it's this network which I think uh, could naturally arise uh, out of um, the uh, over 65 uh, population of uh, uh, caseworkers, if you will, uh, extenders, uh, as, as Stuart mentioned, or um, um, managers of uh, chronic disease that are not um, strictly medical.